Well, welcome everyone. My name is Peter Stock. I'm the president of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association of Canada and also chairman of the Outreach Committee of the Global Home Education Exchange. So on behalf of the Global Home Education Exchange, I would like to welcome you to today's session on advocacy. Uh, I'm going to be moderating the discussion today and um, letting you know this webinar series is a project of GHEX and um, our goal for this series is to help you as a leader in your country to create a robust support structure for homeschoolers in your country, create a national organization. GHEX is supported by many organizations and individuals. And we thank everybody who's, who's a part of our network and supports our work to advance the freedom of home education. We believe that everyone everywhere should have easy access to home education without undue burden from government. As the UN, uh, Declaration on Human Rights states in Article 26.3, parents have a prior right to decide what kind of education their children shall receive. We believe that home education is a natural, fundamental, and inalienable human right. To support the global home educating community, GHEX works to connect leaders, support research, and influence policy. So if you want to learn more about GHEX, visit our website, ghex. Dot world for more information. Well, let's let's push into our seminar here. I have uh, four guests with me today who are our panelists, and they're all experts in in this subject of advocacy. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introduce, introducing each of our panelists. I'll give you a very brief introduction, and I'm going to ask them to tell their own story. Tell us about their homeschooling journey. Tell us about their involvement in advocacy and anything else they want to tell us in, in, to, in some introductory remarks. And, and then we'll move into some questions from our audience. And uh, I think by the end of it, we'll have a pretty good idea um, what advocacy is all about. So today, um, I'm going to start with Christopher Cordero. Christopher it comes to us from Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, he leads, he, he's, a, he's an integral part of uh, the Pestalozzi Trust, which is, is South Africa's homeschool uh, legal defense organization. And he is also, um, he also has founded an organiza organization called Learn Free. So we'll look forward to hearing about that. Uh, Christopher, take it away, please. Thanks, Peter. Let me just say that uh, for some unknown reason, we're experiencing uh, uh, some uh, broadband some some fiber issues here so uh, if i break up or there's a major problem i think maybe call me back as last and i'll see if i can work on that in the interim we we usually have very reliable fiber um so, uh, yeah, so to answer this question about um how can advocacy organizations influence the development of favorable public policy um and i think we, we've set the the scene here but we've, we've raise this issue really is that in certain countries we don't have necessarily as developed a home education uh, environment uh, or movement or perhaps it's, it's not as as well known in the public space um, as it is in American Canada and so that can often present different challenges to to people across the globe um, and I suppose one of the things is the success of home education in Canada and the US, nothing sells like success. So perhaps a lot of our organizations model themselves over those mod on those models. And I think perhaps one of the things that will be very interesting to hear from the panel is, is how do you adapt those models in your country and are they appropriate? So um, how, did, how did I become involved or how I became involved with, uh, with, with home education advocacy was um, rather a shock <laughs> because I, uh, our family been home educating for some time and uh, one bright morning uh, we uh, we found out that our government was going to institute a completely new bill um, and quite a draconian one and quite an invasive one and uh, I, I don't know if Mike is listening in but Mike will appreciate this it was like sort of we woke up one morning and the Soviets had crossed the inter-German border and the issue was, what are we going to do now? Um, <coughs> and I'm so, listening, you got my attention. Uh, uh, yeah. And so to, to stretch the military analogy, it was literally, um, you know, try and deploy the rapid deployment force from the US, get the first armored division onto the ships. But essentially what we were doing was we had to 
well, the, the, the first thing that we had to learn was that we had to slow this advance um, because the policy was this, uh, this, this particular law was very advanced and essentially in its legal process and essentially we had 30 days to comment. And so that's literally how the, um, and so that's literally how we, how we began with that was, and how my involvement began is how do we do this? And luckily I have a, a fairly diverse background, um, we, but I think I'll, I'll view the last, the last military analogy a little bit, we'll call it almost, a, uh, call it almost like in business, a special forces background. So I uh, was able to draw in from a lot of uh, uh, experiencing legislation, communication, marketing, um, strategy to try and look at how we how we craft a response, um, and and the the huge advantage of home education in this uh, and home educate the home educators is home educators are highly highly proactive and active base, and and what then and then our first step was to get home educators to just flood in comments on the, on this bill, and that and that then. Uh, the, the the volume of comments, uh, even home educators in South Africa constitute less than one percent of the population, much less than one percent of the, the learner population. But we in, ended up generating twenty percent of the comments on the bill, um, and we did that by being quite innovative. So that's maybe a, a, a key thing: is when you've got limited resources, you have to rely on innovation. And we, we created kind of templates that allowed people to make comment. That slowed the that that then meant that the department had to start reading, and there was an important thing as well now to to know what are the laws in your particular jurisdiction because in in our case each and every submission has to be read, but if you send in a petition, um, that petition will be viewed essentially as one submission. But if you send in something that's kind of uh, that raises some key or core points, but is personalised, and that has to be treated as a submission. And so the um, and so that meant that these uh, over a thousand submissions by home educators had to be read, and some of these submissions were a hundred pages, um, and that then actually created the time for us to to start doing to start uh, doing all the things that we had to do in order to, um, to 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 kind of begin to change the environment to allow us to challenge that bill, and so. What are the, the key things that, I, that, that, what are the key lessons that you can learn from, from that scenario? Because I think, and what we've learned over the last few years again, is the power of research, having research and home education that you can then quote um, and, and bring to the attention of policymakers and the media, um, having legal research uh, as well. So, so drawing quite a strong distinction between legal research and, and um, and uh, educational research on home education, uh, be able to make the legal human rights, fundamental rights arguments. Um, also, we, uh, and, and so if you want to avoid the shock of waking up on a morning and finding that the, that the, the service have crossed the inter-German border, you've got to start early. So you want to be, you want to be, um, you want to be, you want to be proactive and be on the, on the offensive on every issue, essentially. And you can only really do that if, you, if you've got very good intelligence, which means building up relationships with people in government um, so that you get the, you get, you know that when something's, you know, when it's, when the, when the policy is just being debated in the inner chambers or the inner sanctums, you wanna be able to be, know that that's happening so that you can begin crafting your response. Um, never leaving the table um, in certain jurisdictions, I mean, uh, some in some places um, in some in some jurisdictions, you've got very strong engagement processes. We have in South Africa on paper, but often in practice, people can effectively be ejected from the process. So you've got to stay in the process, and then it's a question of unrelenting pressure. This this battle um, that, that we've been we've been engaged in, if you want to call it that, but this this the struggle to actually get good legislation has now been ongoing for nearly five years. And it's literally a thing of, if not weekly, monthly, you have to be doing something about it in order to challenge it in each step that it goes through the process. Um, I think overall, it, that's a very specific example. Overall, one of the things that I would say, uh, Peter, you, you must probably, you, you know this better from your, from your political background, but politics changes very quickly. So one thing that I would have done differently is had broader and deeper relationships in every political party, 
Um, because if you rely on strong relations with one or two people, they can be moved into different positions, they could lose their seats, etc. And then you have to start building your relationships from scratch. Um, so I think the, the in summary, the key issues are you need to assess your own regulatory universe, know your laws and culture, be open-minded, uh, learn from other countries, but, but create something that's in your own, and to then read the broader environment. All right, thank you, Christopher. I'm gonna go across the Atlantic Ocean now to Vinicius Ray. Vinicius is in Brazil, and he has a background with the National Homeschooling Association there, and he also has a lot of experience in government. So go ahead, Vinicius, tell us about your background, tell us about your experience, and, uh, and tell us about your, your adv advocacy in Brazil. Hey everybody, thank you. Thank you too much for, for being here with you. And our experience here in Brazil has been full of, uh, full of all of kind of experience and of course, and challenge. But see, uh, me and my wife uh, are so deeply grateful to God for, for the call to homeschool our children. Uh, it's something that was generated by him in our hearts over the years then we know when we were getting informed more about the subject um, i was still single when i first heard about homeschool in 2002 uh, because i i became so impressed with families that was taking care of their children in that period but there since that time in the beginning uh, homeschooling was not open and discussed uh, here in Brazil. Even in the Congress, even on seminars, we didn't have we didn't have any kind of association uh, in the beginning of the century. Uh, but after that, uh, when I got married in 2006, me and my wife uh, started to 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 listen more and to to solve. Uh, the, the development of, of, about the homeschool in Brazil. And we, we watched uh, the National Association of Homeschooling be created, ANED, here. And the, when the actual bill was presented in the, in the Congress, it was too important because that time uh, was raising some judicial process against homeschooling families. But a big mistake was committed for a lot of people in Brazil in, the, in that time because they started to, to discuss about homeschooling not based on research facts, but was discussing about the common sense, uh, what the common sense says about homeschooling. Oh, I, I agree, I don't agree, but see, it was not good in the beginning. Uh, and, and it bring uh, it brought a lot of challenge, increased the challenge for for to convince and to to get improvement over homeschooling. Uh, but after that, for me, for my wife, and for all the guys that was involved in homeschooling, we started to to take more, how can I say, more of a professional uh, environment and uh, based and fundamental. Uh, facts to, to discuss about homeschooling. And this was too important for us, including for us to decide to homeschool our children because our, 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 our kids was, uh, was born. In. And I had two, I, I, sorry, I, I have three guys and two of them uh, have gone, had gone to, to school in the beginning, but then we took out and the third one never have never gone to 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 school to to us homeschooling until now, and it was too important for us because we created and take more information, and we received a lot of support, different kinds of support from HLSDA with uh, personal uh, with Mike Donan here, with, for for whom we are so grateful and thankful, and. And it was important because we we started to to take more uh, uh, approach with the public, the different kind of audience can be congressmen, can be 
uh, the press, the media, can be academics, can be different kind of audience. And what was too important for us and that time, on that time and until now, to start this uh, institutional approach, institutional relationship, first uh, is to know and what uh, and how deep or not our audience understand about homeschooling or are interested in homeschooling. Don't try to start talking with uh, uh, with without listening, <laughs> for example. Eh? First, listen is the is the 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 my my first tip that I that I can can give here. And second, to present facts, data, research, objective information, and show families for, for the audience. Show families, bring the families for, for the discussion, bring the families for the environment. Uh, take the families from the, to not be scared, to not be afraid. Uh, is more, I can say there is more dangers for those one who try to be to keep uh, in secret, then those one who show their face, okay, and bring the families, bring the students, bring the results uh, from the, the the homeschoolers and the result for those one who were who were homeschooled. Demonstrate that you and others homeschooler and families are normal. That we exist. Then we, then, then we are not aliens. <laughs> Sorry for for this, uh, this word, but uh, they they think what they think about us. We are normals, okay? We are here. We are we we are father and moms that that we we are concerned about our kids. And third, uh, after that, try to identify those one congressmen or or policymakers that were convinced that, that want to defend you. It's better to have two, three specific guys that are too strong to defend and to promote homeschooling than have a hundred that are just meeting, just convinced that nah, that is okay, but they are not really involved in the cause. And it, it was too important for us in Brazil, for example, in the election in 2018 for Congress and for the governor, we, uh, we decided to, to take a kind of research with the candidates and try to, to talk to them and try to understand if they, they were compromised to, to defend homeschooling in our country and to defend the, the legal recognizement. And that step was too important because we got more closer. And for those one who were elected, uh, we took this list and started to have conversation since they started their mandate. And I show it to them. Do you remember you signed it to defend homeschool? So now we want to support you. We want to offer to you facts. We want to support you research. Uh, seminars, webinars, and and they 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 became like a a, a soldiers, different kind of soldiers. They were not involved. They didn't know homeschooling before, but during this period, they started to get too and too involved and to multiply this to others congressmen. That then we didn't know them. Then uh, uh, more than we could. Uh, imagine in, in the beginning. So these three steps, I, I think, too important. Uh, listen first, uh, present families, present facts, and try to identify those one who will really fight for you. Could be in the Congress, could be in the media, could be in the academic sectors. Thank you, Vinicius. All right, let's head north to just outside of Washington, D.C., and Mike Donnelly. Mike is the um, is the senior counsel for Homeschool Legal Defense Association of the United States. And he's, he also serves as the chairman of the advocacy committee on, uh, on the Global Home Education Exchange. Take it away, Mike.
We can see your screen, but we can't hear you. We can see your words though. Well, it helps if you unmute, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unmute before sharing screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Here we go. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter and everyone. It's uh, great to be with you today. And boy, there is so much to talk about here, but I'm going to try to keep it brief. And I appreciate the words of Chris and Vinicius before me. Um, we're talking about winning in the court of public opinion, but it's, it's much more than public opinion. Uh, advocating for homeschooling requires advocacy in many areas, uh, and each audience is a little bit different. And you know, we're talking about legislators, but also media. We're talking about our neighbors, our friends. We're talking about the culture. Uh, and one thing I think at the outset we can realize is that home homeschooling, home education, it's a global movement. Um, you know, the world has become a much smaller place. We have people here from from many different continents. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, as HSLDA's Senior Counsel and Director for Global Outreach to, to visit uh, many of the places represented here and to get to know some of these individuals and, and many more. And um, the truth is we can help each other. We can learn from each other. Uh, you know, in the United States, we're blessed to have had decades of experience with a growing, flourishing movement and uh, with lots of research. Uh, you know, many people may not realize this, but homeschooling was not legal in the United States in many countries, uh, many states rather, uh, in 1980, only about five states uh, explicitly recognized home education as an exemption from compulsory school attendance in 1980. Uh, it was 15 years before every state in the United States recognized homeschooling as a legal, explicit exemption from compulsory school attendance. Uh, and since then, um, going on 25 years or 30 years now, uh, we have uh, seen homeschooling grow dramatically in the United States from virtually nothing to about 2 million before the pandemic. And now the numbers suggest that homeschooling has doubled or perhaps even tripled or even more in the United States to as many as 8 million children being homeschooled, which is at least 10%, maybe 12 to 15% of the school age population. And, and that's something that it takes a while to lay the groundwork for that. Uh, but we can learn from each other. And I think we have a lot to offer and, and we're available to serve you, your community, and to help you with uh, research, with ideas, with advice, with suggestions, um, with encouragement. If we can be a service to you, please, I hope you will get in contact with me. But I wanna talk about some obstacles. When we talk about winning in the court of public opinion, advocating for homeschooling, we need to recognize that we are up against some obstacles, uh, especially in countries where the homeschooling movement is small. Uh, homeschooling is different. Uh, those of us who are homeschooling, we know that it's, you know, we're doing something different. Uh, and, you know, most people don't do it. Uh, in the United States, 90% of the people don't do it. In other countries, it may be nine, it's 99.9% .9 of the people don't do it. And so they've never even heard of it. They've never considered it. My own story is, uh, you know, I didn't, I'd never heard the word homeschooling put together uh, until I had three children and my neighbor asked me about, you know, what I was going to do uh, for education with our children. My wife and I had been married for uh, eight years at the time. We had three children and we had no idea. We, we knew we didn't want to enroll them in public school. We thought maybe a private, private school. And my, my friend said, well, have you ever considered homeschooling? And I'm like, I had no idea there was such a thing. Uh, it's different. And people hear about it in different ways. But even if you want to do it, you may encounter some different reactions from your friends, from your neighbors, from your, from your family. Uh, and so we're talking about the culture. Uh, and people, you know, if they have heard about it, they have these stereotypes, these these caricatures in their minds uh, about what they imagine homeschooling 
is and what homeschoolers are like. And so when you say, oh, well, homeschooling, they get these ideas in their head. So we have to realize that we're up against these stereotypes also. Uh, and the fact that it's unknown to most people. Many people fear the unknown. Uh, they don't understand something, they fear it. Uh, you know, most people are not willing to, to take that path that's been less trodden, uh, that's been less taken. And uh, so they are in some ways maybe threatened personally by this idea of people doing something differently. So we need to know that there's a maybe an unspoken obstacle that we may be up against with our friends, neighbors, and family. And also we need to recognize that homeschooling threatens the status quo. Uh, there are entrenched interests in, in a variety of uh, areas in, in cultures and in, in your country and in your, in your society. Uh, and that includes the big education industry. Education uh, is one of the single largest budget items in any government expense. There are unions of teachers, there are unions of school boards, there are unions of school administrators, all dedicated to protecting their turf, their territory, uh, their power, uh, and, and their bureaucracy. And the way you protect bureaucracy is by you know, controlling everything within it, making it bigger. That's just a fact of life. And so we've got to realize that you know, home education threatens that status quo. And so there are interests that are arrayed against us. Um, now, it's interesting in the United States, uh, we were able to, to prevail, even though we were up against the most powerful entrenched interest groups existing. And you know, many people would say that's, that's miraculous. It's a, an evidence of God's protection of, of homeschooling. And I believe that's true. Uh, but I think there are some other things about the United States that make our country different that contributed to the growth of homeschooling. And that's not what we're going to talk about here. But these are three obstacles that if we are going to be advocating for homeschooling, and whether it's in the media, in legislatures, or in the culture, we need to know and identify those obstacles. And, and there are others, but these are just some ways of thinking about those obstacles. Um, and as we are out there advocating for home education, we need to have a good message. Um, you know, we, we want to have a winning message. And, and it's going to be communicated in different words, in different ways, in different cultures, in different countries, in different languages. But ultimately, I believe there are three winning messages that um, you should consider. And if you have ideas for other winning messages, I want to hear them because I'm sure there are others. But this is how I think about it. And this is based on 15 years of experience communicating uh, the home education message in the media, uh, in the culture, uh, and in legislative bodies, both national, international, uh, and at the state and provincial level. First of all, you know, people are concerned, you know, if, if an obstacle is they think that homeschooling is weird uh, and isolating, which we know it's not, the research says it isn't, but they think it is, we've got to have a message that home education is good for kids. It's good for children. Children are not going to be harmed by home education. Uh, and, and we can communicate the research. Uh, we can communicate the stories. And as Vinicius said, I completely agree. Um, we'll talk about that in a few moments in the, in the four P's and principles of how to advocate that I've come up with for you here, but the faces of homeschooling, the families of homeschooling, we've got to get the families out. We've got to get out there and, and communicate and show that that's true. So it's, there is excellent academic and social outcomes in home education. That's the norm. That's average. Excellence is just average in homeschooling when compared to other populations. So that's a winning message, I think, and it's a critical one. Uh, freedom. Freedom is a winning message. Who doesn't want to be free? Everyone wants to be free to pursue their own hopes, dreams, uh, desires for themselves, for their, for their families, and for their children. And that's a winning message. We found that freedom in itself is a winning message. So when we, when we cloak, when we wrap, uh, when we place home education in the context of, the, of a larger freedom message, that's a winning message. Second, home education is good for communities and it's good for countries. Home educators, uh, the research shows, volunteer. They're active in civil society. And that's something that most democracies and participat participatory governments value to a degree. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, and that's different from politics, but, and then pluralism. Uh, pluralism is respecting differences. It's not multiculturalism, although some people talk about it in the context of multiculturalism, but it's about pluralism. It's about realizing that within our countries, we can do things differently. And that when we do things differently and we, we create space and room for people to pursue their own personal vision uh, for their families, for their communities, based on uh, self-governing principles, that's good for communities. That's good for countries, generally speaking. Finally, the human rights aspect. Uh, we in the home education community can talk on solid ground when it comes to international law and human rights. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the United Nations and other institutional bodies and countries and movements um, who want to control education for their own purposes believe that they are on solid ground. And so they only talk about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But when you understand the totality of, of education rights and uh, the international human rights law and aspects of you know the last, what has it been, 19, 50, 60, 70 years since uh, the UN started with the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the different treaties that come out of that, we are on very solid ground. Um, to argue that home education is a natural, fundamental, and inalienable right. When you look at education, you can look to UDHR 26.3, which defines education, but ultimately says that parents have a prior right to decide the kind of education that shall be given to their children. This is a very important principle, uh, that the family unit is the fundamental group unit of society, Article 16.3. Uh, parents are key in the context of education and in education rights, where the state must respect and protect uh, the rights of parents to make these decisions. And when you look at the International Bill of Rights, the International Coven Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, uh, and the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, and other, uh, the, the African uh, Covenants, the Inter-American uh, Convention, uh, you can find the support for uh, you know, the family as a primary body for education. And, and so, you know, to the extent that this is persuasive in your country, we are on very solid ground and we need not fear um, these, you know, treaties and human rights. We can use them to advance messages. And, and we should not forget, you know, our own cultural and constitutional frameworks. Most of those in free and democratic societies will also support this idea of education within the family, even though, as, as has happened in some countries like Brazil, like Germany, uh, where in Brazil, the Supreme Court there, you know, found that homeschooling was okay, it wasn't unconstitutional, or that's helpful in some respects, it could have been better. Uh, but, you know, in Germany, you have a, a court there interpreting its constitution, which says that, you know, the family, you know, has priority to be backwards, you know, even though there are on the paper, the explicit recognition of these rights, sometimes the governing mechanisms may not recognize that. Uh, and so we have to be prepared then to advocate before and after um, court cases that, that may be harmful. Um, so how do we do that? Well, I, I wanna give you four principles to consider when we're engaging with public opinion, opinion. And when I talk about public opinion, we're talking about culture, we're talking about media, we're talking about politics. Uh, because culture, when you think about it, culture is upstream from both media and politics. The, but they influence each other. But I think the, the culture is stronger. And when you think about what's upstream from culture, you've got families, you've got belief systems, you've got religion, those things. So those are important. But we can be present. We need to be present. Um, if you're trying to make space, create space in your country for your movement, for the homeschooling movement, you have got to be present in all of these areas. You have to be present in the culture. Uh, you have to be present in media. You have to be present in politics. Uh, you know, if you if you show up, as they say, showing up is ninety percent of anything. You've just got to show up and and be present and not give up. Um, you know, some people can get discouraged. Uh, you know, they they may be tempted to say, "Oh, this is too hard." Well, that's the test we have as, as home educators in countries. Uh, where it's it's small, and that's the test we had in the United States. We had to be present. We had to show up and 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 fight. And in 50 states, in many places, we had to do it. Uh, but if if you if you do show up, 
and you don't give up, uh, you will you'll be victorious. You will prevail. If you give up, if you cede the battlefield, so to speak, um, then you will fail. Um, we have to be persistent. Uh, we have to be persistent in uh, showing up all the time. <laughs> Whenever there's something happening that uh, will allow us to get our winning messages out, we've got to be there. Uh, we've got to be there all the time. Um, we've got to create relationships. As Chris said, I think that's absolutely essential. Um, that's how you persuade people, uh, which is the next point, being persuasive. So, you know, people don't care um, how much you know until they know how much you care. Said another way, um, people, you know, will be much more willing to listen to you after you have listened to them. And so we can't just be messengers who jump into every situation and just blast out our message um, because that's it's not going to be received. We have to develop relationships with legislators, with cultural influencers, with members of the media by listening to them, by helping them, by finding out what's important to them. And it's going to be different in each area. And then once we've developed that relationship face to face, we'll be much more persuasive. As Vinicius said, you know, bringing the families to the legislature. There is no substitute for bringing good-looking, good families, families whose children are excellent representatives for homeschooling, to meet with their legislators. Um, we need to put a face to the names of, of the families and the movement. And that's what it means to be practical. Uh, so being practical, we've got to think about ways that we can engage with these influencers legislators, reporters, um, means having a website. It means writing a lot. It means networking and making contacts with reporters and people who write about education. And, you know, for example, um, you know, if you can bring stories to the reporters, you know, they won't write about it every time. But if they know that when an issue presents itself, they can turn to you for a comment or a quote to help them on their story. That's good because reporters, you know, you know, they, uh, you know, they're busy people and, uh, you know, you can make it easy for them. Uh, we also, you know, in being persuasive and practical, we want to be positive, right? It's very easy to say, oh, the schools are terrible. Uh, people, you know, people already know that, okay? Or they're not great. They're not doing good. People know that. We don't need to, to, to harp on that or focus on that. We have a positive message that's good for children. Homeschooling is good for children. It's good for countries. It's good for communities. And, uh, and, and we can let the schools just sort of be there. Now, that doesn't mean you don't talk about them when asked. But the point is, we have a positive message. And so uh, we want to share that positive message. So it's a big job uh, to change a culture. In, in some countries, there's a very hostile culture, such as Sweden or Germany or France. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to uh, change a culture, but if we want to make homeschooling freely available, that's what we've got to do. So I hope this has been helpful. Thank you, Peter. Let me turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mike. All right, let's, uh, let's head to Africa again. And uh, we're going to the nation of Kenya now. We'll hear from our friend Wazwa Kanut. Wazwa, uh, tell us about homeschooling in, in Kenya. Tell us about your experience and uh, tell us about advocacy. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter and the rest of the panel. Um, yeah, my name is Kanut Wazwa from Nairobi, Kenya. Kenya lies on the east coast of Africa, right astride the equator. So as you guys are having snow and negative temperatures and you wake up, we're enjoying our sun here in the equator. Uh, anyways, uh, my wife and I have homeschooled our three children from birth. So it's uh, our, our eldest turns 16 in April next year. Uh, and then we have a boy who's 14 and then our youngest just turned 12. And interestingly, um, we, we got into this space of advocacy in a very funny way uh, because we had been homeschooling for about you know, consciously for three years or rather our daughter was three, we were enjoying playing in the mud, reading her books. And so we got researching into the state of homeschooling in Kenya. And that's when we came 
across a very interesting aspect of our constitution because the preamble of the constitution said every child had a right to education. But when you went into the Education Act, which in a sense translates the basic structure framework of the constitution into operational terms, it started mentioning schools, you know, government schools, public schools, Christian schools. Uh, now we just picked it out uh, in passing. We never really thought about it. Uh, just thinking, I mean, any expert would tell you if you say every child has a right to education, then go ahead and define education. Don't define school. But anyways, um, in 2010, that's about 12 years ago, Kenya was getting a new constitution. Uh, and so Kenya is Commonwealth, uh, just like Canada and the UK. And, and part of this process is something called public participation. Uh, and you're supposed to bring in your views into what you'd like to change the constitution, what you'd like to see in the new constitution. And we said, hmm, this sounds like an interesting place to say, can you mention homeschooling in the Education Act? Well, uh, looking back, <laughs> I'm glad we had a very poor sense of the odds against us because uh, we went out, we are greenhorn homeschoolers uh, getting into a constitution review process that we had no idea about uh, of where to even start. And so we got together with like-minded homeschoolers and that's where the adventure began. Uh, in a very short time, we discovered that the whole public participation process, it is actually designed to be inconvenient for the citizenry. Um, it is designed to discourage you. Um, for example, the, we'd write to the Education Committee in Parliament, write to the Ministry of Education, write to the minister himself, and he'd give us appointments for 5 a.m. in the morning. Now, which government official tells you to go see them at 5 a.m. in the morning? Well, we'd be there at 4 a.m. with our thermos full of tea waiting for the minister. Uh, and at the end, he just said, you guys, uh, we have no time for you. You look like you have your thing figured out. You just go and sort out yourselves. Um, eventually, when we got the new constitution, we didn't get what we wanted, uh, but we learned because at least the new constitution said that the parents have the right to decide the mode of education they like for their children, which was an asymptote tending towards what we desired. Um, we didn't get homeschooling expressly mentioned in the constitution, uh, but later we realized that was not necessarily a bad thing. Now, uh, in, in this whole adventure, uh, what are some of the things we learned? Uh, the first lesson that we learned is the fact that when it comes to public participation, uh, political promises, how government works and how things are on the ground are three totally different ballgames. And I'm sure this applies even for Canada and the US and South Africa. Because <laughs> politicians will come promising their thing and then they get into office based on those promises. And then you get to discover government works very differently. Government is a bureaucracy. Everything is anchored in legislature. And so unless things happen like this, it is not going to move. Even the politicians get frustrated. And then things on the ground are such that uh, no one likes to ruffle feathers. And so people would rather continue with what has already been happening uh, so long as no one is making noise somewhere. We are all good. Uh, and, and the other thing that we discovered is because Kenya was a British colony and the way a colony works is such that the systems are designed for control. At independence, the design fundamentally did not change. So that today, even our legal jurisprudence, even our civil service, 
even our education system is designed for control. And when you want to go and change that, you are actually taking on a system. And the people who are controlling the system might call them the stakeholders in the educational industry. They don't want this control to change hands. And so that's a lesson that we learned on the job. Uh, but ultimately, if you'd ask me, what did I wish I had known earlier when I was getting into this space? Uh, the first thing I'd say is, I wish I knew that I was getting into a judo game. You know, uh, judo is, uh, is a Jap Japanese martial art. And, and the way judo fundamentally works is when you are fighting someone who is bigger and heavier and stronger than you, what you do is to use their advantage against them. Just look for the weak point and, and, and trip them and they fall down and, and you get the point. And, and so when you are in advocacy and you are taking on government, you are really in a game of judo. They have the resources. Uh, you cannot win it. But because of how big they are, even for them to turn, they need such big space that you can look for a place where you can just get government bureaucratic inertia and then zero in on that. Um, do a simple letter, uh, get it acknowledged, have it in your file. Uh, and when you go to engage with them, you tell them, by the way, we are waiting to hear from you. We wrote to you this letter. Any developments on this? And because many times in government, even one arm of government has absolutely no idea what is going on somewhere else. Um, it helps to buy you time uh, for you to be able to strategize a bit more. Um, uh, the other thing I've come to realize is, uh, again, what Mike and Chris said is, when it comes to media, um, always be ready, you know, so that uh, even when the, the, the media houses call you, many times they will ask you questions, but you can see they have a colored perspective of what homeschooling is. And so just learning to answer the question behind the question, use it as an opportunity to educate them, uh, even help them to ask the right questions. You know, they always throw in the socialization question, and you tell them that's a very good question. In fact, we are solving the same problems. Have you looked at what evidence says? And then answer the question the way you want to answer it and not the way they want to answer it. And so those are lessons they have learned. I have learned the lessons you continue to learn. Uh, as I said, uh, we got in as an adventure and 13 years on, the adventure is still going on. Uh, thanks, Peter, back to you. Thank you. All right, and uh, we move to our final panelist now, Russ Hebert. Uh, Russ Hebert is uh, on the board of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association of Canada. He's located just outside of Vancouver. Um, and uh, the reason we've saved him to last is because uh, among his experiences, he spent over a decade as a member of parliament in the Canadian parliament. So he's actually been on the receiving end of advocacy and has a unique perspective to bring us. Russ, tell us a little bit about your homeschooling journey and and uh, and tell us what you'd like us, us to know about advocacy, please. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> the topic of how to start a legal defense organization in your country uh, is easily connected to the question of how to influence policymakers, as it's the policymakers that create the laws that you're trying to change or use to protect the families that you seek to represent. So as Peter mentioned, I'm a homeschooling father of four kids and a former lawyer and politician who was elected four times as a federal member of parliament in Canada. And I can tell you, and I'll allude to it probably more later, but one of the highlights for me was experiencing those families that you earlier speakers talked about coming to my office and seeing how respectful and intelligent and uh, knowledgeable they were in the questions that they asked as they were learning about government. But let me start more at the beginning of my story. I was first introduced to home education when I was a new MP and was asked to bring greetings on behalf of my government at a regional home education conference. It was there that I met a professional psychologist and international authority on child development by the name of Dr. Gordon Neufeld. The key theme of his speech, which is also the subject of his best-selling book, 
was a message to parents to hold on to your kids. His message was parents need to make sure that they matter more to their children than their children's friends do. His research showed a disturbing trend of children, mostly in institutional school settings, looking to their peers for their values, their identity, and codes of behavior as a result of spending the vast majority of their time with kids of their same age. To quote from his book, he says, it is this peer orientation that undermines family cohesion, interferes with healthy development, and fosters a hostile and sexualized youth culture. It results in children becoming overly conformist, desensitized, and alienated, such that being cool matters more to them than anything else." End quote. So when our children came along, my wife and I decided to try home education. I've since become a wholehearted convert to home education and currently serve, as Peter mentioned, on the board for the Homeschool Legal Defense Association in Canada. So when starting a legal defense organization in your country, you need to focus on influencing the public policy or laws in your nation to protect and improve the conditions for parents to educate their children. You do this because it is worthwhile. It is a good for society. It recognizes and supports the fundamental and primary right of all parents, the right and obligation for parents to decide how their children will be educated. As we all know, and as has been mentioned, there are some countries that do not recognize this right or substantially hinder this right and make it difficult for parents to exercise this right and responsibility. And the degree of freedom that parents have is an indicator or a measure of the freedom, liberty, and health of the nation in which they live. If a government does not recognize that children are first and foremost under the authority and responsibility of their mother and father and not the state, that is a sign that the government does not truly believe in freedom. Furthermore, the reality is, is that mass institutional education is failing. And so at the very least, nations need to allow and better yet encourage alternative methods of education, like home education, if for no other reason than to allow competition into what has become a largely monopolized industry. So now that we've established the why to influence, the next question is, which policymakers should you try and influence? Well, instead of trying to influence the bureaucrats or the regulators, focus on the elected officials, as they have the power to change the law and make a lasting impact. Changing the law is more difficult, but once accomplished, will likely be there for a longer period of time. Now, how do you influence them? Well, you start by aligning their interests with your interests. Most of them will be interested in getting reelected and in doing what is best for the society or community in order to get reelected. So show them that by changing the law to support freedom in home education, it will be good for their country and for children and that people will vote for them and volunteer for them to support their leadership in this area. So you start by contacting them. And this is gonna get practical, but it's important. Send them, you send them an email or give them a call and ask your elected official for a short meeting of 15 to 30 minutes. Don't expect too much. Ask for an online meeting or an in-person meeting in their constituency office or in the Capitol. You're gonna to need to be persistent, as has been mentioned. Expect to have to make this request several times. As you do, be nice to their staff, as the staff controls whether or not you'll even get a meeting. Remember, they will talk to their boss about how they were treated, especially if they were treated poorly. <clears throat> and yes, we all know that they work for you, but still, show honor and express gratitude for their public service. That goes a long way to building a bridge, which is the next point, is to prepare your message carefully with the intent to build that bridge. These are busy people and they receive many requests for meetings. So be prepared and act professional. This is not the time to complain. Be clear and direct about exactly what you're asking for. And if you can, propose a solution if you point out a problem. 
practically write out three to five key points that you want to make. So for example, you could uh, come to them and explain how difficult it is to comply with the current laws in your country, but then go further and explain how the law could be changed to make it better. And finally, have patience. Recognize that changing the law is a lengthy process. So study that process of how laws are made and changed so that you can understand what needs to happen. If you build a bridge and find an ally, support them between and during elections as well. Volunteer in their campaigns. And when you, and when you find people that are opposed to freedom, work to replace them and find new and better representatives. In conclusion, by getting involved in the public policy process, you will ensure a better future, not only for your children or for the children of your community or your nation, but also for future generations. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Russ. All right. Um, now we have, a, we have an audience with us today and I'm just gonna ask those who uh, have questions, you can put them in the bottom there in the Q&A and I will try to get through as many of them as possible. Um, I have a question already uh, in the Q&A from South Africa. So uh, this, this individual asks, and I'll just read the question. In South Africa, the education sector is very much controlled by the teachers unions. They see home education as a threat to teacher jobs. What should our message be to get the support of unions? Well, that's an interesting question. Anybody wanna take a stab at that from our panel? Wave a hand. <laughs> Mike, Mike, go ahead and, and give us an answer to that one. Uh, well, <laughs> good luck is what I say. Um, I don't think you'll ever get teachers unions to be on our side, but you can, you can uh, be effective in uh, them not becoming uh, obstacles. In the early years of homeschooling, battles in, in the United States, teachers unions were the primary, one of the primary, if not the primary obstacle, because they had the numbers that they could bring to the Capitol. And there are, we have a, there are a number of stories of how the teachers unions fought hard against the homeschooling movement in the United States. One example I'm aware of is in Nebraska, where uh, there was a, uh, a legislative hearing going on and a teacher, uh, actually, this is back in the 80s, um, the teacher actually showed up with her teacher certificate to uh, testify before the legislative panel. And uh, she sat there and she said, uh, this law, which would allow for homeschooling of children, uh, and back then, you know, all the laws that they were demanding required that you had to be a certified teacher to be able to teach your kids. And that's what they wanted to try to make everybody be a certified teacher. Uh, she said, and that, that law, does this to my teacher certificate and she tore up her teacher certificate right there in front of the legislative panel and uh and that didn't go over too well <laughs> with the legislators um but the point is that even in the in the u.s it's been what 30 40 years of homeschooling has grown we're huge uh well accepted by society at large uh, the evidence you know demonstrates that home education is effective in, in all areas of producing good, well-rounded, socialized citizens. Um, the National Education Association continues to have um, a part of their platform as being opposed to home education. Uh, they, they want everyone who teaches a child to be a certified teacher. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know how you could ever get teachers unions to be on your side. Um, now, there are teachers many teachers who homeschool their own kids or whose children are homeschooled by the other parent or during you know, their part-time or however they do it. Uh, and there are many members of school administration, superintendents and others who also uh, homeschool their children. Uh, not a majority, but a significant number. So there are friends in those groups, but as a, as a policy matter, uh, I don't think you should waste waste your time, invest your time trying to make the teachers union support you. Uh, you should look at ways to neutralize their influence. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I like to try to think about things creatively, so I don't want to say that you could never 
accomplish what you're suggesting, but I'm just not sure that it's a worthy investment of anyone's time. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else have a comment on uh, teachers unions? Yes, uh, me, uh, what happened, what I see in South Africa, it's, it's similar to Brazil. Uh, teachers union and left party um, and other kind of group who are too involved uh, nowadays with the globalist vision. I can say that they are increasing in opposition of home education. And what I see also, and I started to talk to others here in Brazil, uh, no matter what you present to, to discuss with them about research results, uh, we need to do it. We need to increase and to, to proclaim the truth, <laughs> and the truth about homeschooling also. But in the end, this kind of group, their mindset, they are really not concerned about education. Because if they were, they would agree with homeschooling, with home education, with freedom education. They want to control the education, but not only they control the education, they want to control the families. If you listen, if you study their arguments, they are, they are completely uh, empty of logic. The only way they see is we can keep the family uh, far from the kids. They say they here in Brazil they got the point to wrote that they state need to prevent and to protect the kids against the parents. What? Yeah, is what they say they used to say is their mindset. So uh, they are their arguments in these calls, teachers union and other groups. They really aren't trying to, to get a, a good point of view, a good solution, or a reasonable uh, way to think about education. They want to control. They want to control families. They want to control kids. So our fight is against this kind of mindset. It's more than just fact. So we need to be, uh, how can I say, we need to be, uh, firmer, we need can, we need to be positioned. What about what speaking and telling to 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 the audience to talk to the good guys, of course, to the teachers. As Mike said, for example, uh, argument one teach one teacher can teach for 30, 40, 50 kids in a room, but here in Brazil, one teach one teacher sorry cannot teach their they they one son. Hello, why not? <laughs> so uh, they don't have good and, and through, uh, real arguments. They have just argument against families is what I see. All right, thank you, Vinicius. All right, let's move on to another question. Um, Peter, it looks like this, Chris this... wants to chime in on this oh, one. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Since he's from South Africa and the question was from <laughs> South Africa, it would be great to hear what he has to say. Um, yeah, so, so I just uh, and then begin with a, a great South Africanism, which is yeah. But anyway, um, the, uh, I think I think the first issue with teachers unions is is and with all things really begin with the, with the very big picture, which is the teachers unions are under incredible pressure um, globally um, because I think that there's a current prediction of I think something like within the next ten to twenty years, forty five percent. Of, of teachers will leave the profession. So they're in, a, they're in a situation which over time is going to get progressively weaker, which could make them more aggressive um, against home education. But, but, but that can only last a short time as they begin to lose power. So I think the, the global education environment is changing. So I think we can have some hope in that environment. Um, in terms of how, so I, I, I actually endorse what, what, uh, what Mark said, which is, I think when you've done everything else, this is most probably what you can do. So, um, but I do like the creative challenge. 
So um, I think you know your match beta, your match beta um, served uh, looking at how to neutralize their power and how to and how to bring people into your camp. But in the long run, if you have the time, I think there may be some there may be some strategies that you could use. I think the one is to broaden. Uh, and this may not be appropriate to each and every organization. It's in fact one of the reasons why we created Learn Free um, is, is to have, it, have education as part of your, your portfolio or have a, 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 a partner organization which has which can partner you and have home education as part of your portfolio, but then have an organization that's broader and that talks to education in general, because then in general you'll find some opportunities to be co-belligerents with unions on maybe increasing quality in schools or something like that. Um, and, and you can then access and, and have access to at least have a discussion with them on that basis. And then I think the other one is that we know that the long-term trend is towards individualized education. Um, the mass education is, is not probably had its day or has had its day. So the um, so speak to the academics in the unions, the kind of people who and the academics in, in academia to set the agenda for the future and, and really start beginning the debate on how can you make education in school more like home education? Um, and, and then starting and encourage them in that kind of debate. And, that, and, and that's what many teachers, many teachers become very negative because that, that's really their ideal. They go into that system and then they, and, and then they become, I suppose, perhaps, uh, perhaps sort of, uh, having to inform, become more, almost more angry in that system because it's not working in a natural way of learning. So I think those are kind of, but, but, but absolutely I agree with my kind of like the creative challenge of the week. But um, that's, my, that, those, that's my two cents on that. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, Mike, did you have your hand up? Did you want to add something else? Well, actually, I, I think... Um, you know, as we move from that question, I think Chris brought up a fantastic <clears throat> point that really deserves some attention here uh, by this panel, which is the idea of coalitions. Uh, it, it's absolutely um, essential, if possible, to create relationships with other like-minded organizations um, that are not specifically homeschooling. Uh, in the United States, we have done this. Now, in the early days, we, we didn't really have a lot of other entities to help us. So we just had to do it ourselves. And, you know, by God's grace and the work of thousands and thousands of engaged parents in our democracy, we were able to achieve incredible, just incredible victory in the face of opposition from the teachers unions we just talked about. But now um, there are other organizations that are uh, supportive of limited government educational freedom. And um, if you reach out to them, uh, oftentimes you will get a warm reception and they often have more significant resources available. Uh, homeschooling communities are fairly resource constrained, if I can say it that way. Uh, you know, families are stre stretched and it can be hard to find financial resources, but some of these other organizations are able to access larger pockets of funding. And so they will have lobbyists that uh, you can also partner with. And if you educate them uh, and you build a relationship with them, they can provide intelligence to you. They can become partners. They can carry your message. They can alert you to things that are happening behind the scenes that you just don't know about. Uh, this is a strategy that we've been using for at least the last 20 years in the US um, because there's just so much going on and it's impossible for any one organization to keep up with it. And there are other organizations that uh, can that are interested in supporting us. So look for other think tanks, education freedom or education policy organizations that support parental involvement, parents' rights organizations. Uh, these are the kinds of organizations that if, if you focus on them and reach out to them and develop a relationship with them, they can be very helpful. And I'm sure Russ would probably... Uh, be able to comment on the impact of a coalition, in addition to the kinds of grassroots activism that he spoke about, which is essential. So it's not just one thing or the other. We have to be able to do multiple uh, activities at the same time to defend uh, our freedom. All right. Thank you, Mike. I have a question here that that uh, is um, probably a, a lot more challenging to answer. And this comes from somebody who's in a country um, 
that doesn't it, it appears does not have a particularly democratic government. So the question is this, what would be your advice for a situation for, where the homeschooling movement is only at a very early stage, um, maybe just a handful of families in a post-communist and corrupt country, there's no representative policymakers or lawmakers since they, they don't need acceptance of, of uh, the public majority to, to get done what they wanna do. Um, right now, the individual says we work more on building homeschooling our, our homeschooling community, but they're really not sure how to get started legally um, uh, once once their community reaches a sufficient size. Anybody want to take a stab at offering advice to folks in countries where homeschooling is <laughs> perhaps uh, very, very challenging from a legal perspective? Mike, can I start with you on that one? Of course, I'm happy to, you know, as, as people who know me would say, hey, I have an opinion on everything. And sometimes, you know, it's uh, sometimes people want to hear it. <laughs> anyway, Aziz, it's great. Thank you for your question. And thanks for being here. Thank you for sharing the country. Um, you know, it's a tough one. Um, I would say so the question specifically, um, advice where homeschooling is very early stage, post-communist country, um, you know, just do it. <laughs> if I could just say, if I could say that, do it. If uh, in many countries like this, the authorities are too busy to care about a few people um, who are homeschooling. Now, if you're in Cuba or a country like Cuba, that is a communist country, and they are really jealous about their communist ideology, um, you know, the story of Pastor Ramon Rigal, who is someone who I've been helping and have helped over the years, who went to prison because he was homeschooling his children. Uh, it was just him and a few people in his church in a rural area in Guantanamo, Cuba. And, and so if you live in a country like that, you're going to have a very difficult time, very difficult time. And you're, the best thing for you probably to do if you live in a country like that is to leave the country before you try to do something like that, if it's really that important to you for your children. Some people might need to stay in that country. Pastor Ramon is still there. He felt called by God, he's a pastor, to homeschool his children and to stand up to the Cuban regime on this issue of educational oppression. And he's still there, um, although it's a very difficult situation. So if you're in a situation that, like that, or in Germany, for example, where if you come to the attention of the state and you risk the integrity of your family, if you risk your children being taken away from you, which is a real threat in some countries like Germany and Cuba. My advice is get out, leave before you even try to do something like that. And uh, you know, there are organizations like HSLDA who would be willing to assist. We've helped people leave countries before. Um, but if you can get away with it, if the authorities are like, eh, whatever, who cares? You know, as long as you're not bothering anybody, as long as you're not causing a political opposition. Uh, on issues that they care about, then, you know, just stay on the radar screen, be quiet, quietly do your thing, and look for opportunities to cultivate those relationships that Russ was talking about with, with members of the governing authority. And, you know, you may have a, a show democracy. Um, you know, I don't know if it's a dictatorship or what you have in your country, but there are people in power and so whether they're elected or not, or whether they're elected in name only, uh, you still need to try to find a way to develop a relationship with them, those in power, so that you can over time convince them that you're not a threat, that it's okay for people to do it, that you're not against the regime, that you're just, you're not a political opposition front group, um, you're not looking to topple the country. I mean, that's just a reality. Otherwise, they, if they see you as a, as a threat, they'll stamp you out in a heartbeat uh, and they'll go after you. Uh, so you either have to leave the country if you can, or find a way to coexist with the existing power structure. Um, and if there's something that we can do to help you, um, you know, we'll be glad to be glad to do it. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, anybody else? have some comments on that uh, question or series of questions? Yeah, sure, Peter. Uh, just to follow up on what Mike suggested, which was excellent advice. 
I would say that as you, uh, if you choose to stay in your country and uh, work underground, as you build those relationships with those representatives, or they're not representatives, but with the government officials, I would say focus on the relationship before disclosing what you're doing. Um, it's far easier for people, elect, uh, government representatives, to feel uh, some sense of uh, collegiality with somebody that they get along with. And if it comes out at some later point that, oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned this, but you know, we're home educating our kids. You've already established a relationship with them. They've already identified you hopefully as somebody who's credible and trustworthy um, and reliable. And that takes some time to build. So establish the, the foundation of that relationship. I would say before reaching the subject about the importance of home education. And when you do that, you'll be you'll have some, uh, some background uh, in your relationship to, to buttress and hopefully endure what could be a, a difficult um, conversation or uh, you know, building an ally is, is part of that process. And you want them to help recognize that you're a good person who's doing what's best for their family and uh, you just want the government's support. Thank you, Russ. Anybody else have a comment? Okay, I'm going to go on to another question. Um, this one is uh, this is this is sort of being answered uh, by some of you. Um, I'll throw it out there anyway, and maybe if you have some additional thoughts on it, uh, you, you could chime in. So the basic question is: somebody in a country that that uh, has has not got a national organization yet, maybe has an issue. Um, they're they're just your average homeschooling family. Maybe they don't have professional skills. Maybe there's not a lawyer or a skilled lobbyist or somebody with real experience in government among them. Do they need those special skills? Can anybody be an advocate? And if so, how do they get started? Um, Vinicius, could I maybe uh, ask you to start start us off on answering that question, please? Uh, you're, you're muted, Vinicius. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh... Peter, uh, can you repeat the question? I was trying to- Sure, to sure. It's, so the question is, uh, how, how does one get started? Uh, you're, you're represent, let, let's say somebody is, is, is in a country that doesn't have a homeschool organization, but they're facing a problem. Um, do they need special skills? Do they have to be a lawyer? Do they have to have experience with government? Um, can anybody do it? Can any homeschool family do this? Yeah, uh, those are, anyone, can, can start it. It's not necessary, we used to say, to be a lawyer, to be a specialist on, on the team. Uh, the, the first thing we need is, is the heart, is the heart involved. Uh, as Mike said in, the, uh, in another phrase, let me try to, to remember here, was too, too important. Uh, they, the, the, the audience needs to to know uh, how much you care. Yeah, it, this was too important for me, Mike, to listen. Uh, it's because it's what can be more helpful to convince. To start an uh, organization, of course, you can think about the legal approach to, to create organization in your country. It's important to, to know how to do it, but especially you need to get involved with other families and other guys that has the heart and cares about kids, cares, cares about homeschooling, cares about uh, freedom education. This is too important because these guys uh, will help you to get more strength and make a plan how, how the steps you need to, to take, uh, you need to do. You, for example, in Brazil, uh, at the Congress, at the House, we have more than 500 congressmen. Uh, we don't have people enough to, to get involved with all of them. We was necessary for us to, uh, to create uh, a kind of plan, uh, step by step, to get more involved with some of them. And some of these debris, as I, as I said before, uh, became like leaders inside the Congress for us, representing our cows there. Of course, they have a lot of cows in the Congress, but 
we have some guardians uh, in this situation. So it's important to, to organize information from the world and from your country about homeschooling movement, about freedom educational. Uh, it's important to, to prepare uh, some samples and to raise more information, some research. And I also used to say there is important you have prepared, uh, how can I say, example of documents to use. Uh, because I know that a lot of people have fluence to talk, to, to, to be comfortable to, to talk, but even for those one who, who are more shy and don't use to, to talk a lot, uh, can, for example, use some documents to present. And no, if you want to know more about homeschooling, here, uh, here uh, you have more of it. Uh, or for example, here you have a kind of good, re good regulation you can present as a bill. For, um, so I, I'm trying to, to say different kind of approach you can you have, you can organize in your country, in your association organization to, to promote more uh, the homeschooling movement in your country. Great, anybody else want to chime in on that question? Yeah, um, I, I'd like to do that. Um, now, I'd, I'd like to start by saying that any constitution in any country is actually a logical framework. There is the basic structure and then there is the preamble and then there are the articles. And it is so logical that anyone who can read and write and who understands basic philosophy, you know, just the four laws of truth, the law of identity, the law of rational inference, the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, you can actually look at the preamble and look at the article and say, now, by rational inference, this one speaks at cross purposes to this. And right there, you are actually speaking expertly into the situation. Uh, secondly, from my experience in Kenya, uh, when you become a homeschooler, and, and I'm sure for all of us who have homeschooled, you end up becoming an expert in, in history and mathematics and algebra <laughs> and, and language because you are learning with your children. And so when it comes to the Education Act in Kenya, I, I can tell you, I have not seen any expert on the Education Act in Kenya better than the homeschoolers. Even in the situations where we have had for some reason or other to give briefs to lawyers, we are the ones who end up giving them the brief and how to frame it because the Education Act is such a small part of the constitution and since this is where we train our eyes on every day, come rain, come shine, come wind, come weather, we sleep over it. We've ended up becoming experts on it. And so you end up being very good on this specific aspect of education and the constitution. Uh, and finally, and, and I think Vinicus has, has, point, has alluded to it, when you just look at government data, you know, just tell them, okay, public school data, this is standardized tests, this is your own data, this is how your students are performing. 50% uh, of students are failing. Uh, and you ask the government official, do you think there is a problem? They always start by saying, yes, we think there is a problem. And by doing that, you make them realize that you are part of the solution they are looking for then you get into that conversation by making them feel they are actually pulling on the same side. When you unpack everything, you're actually rooting for the same team. So don't you think that this is an option that you can take up? And so in, in that way, I've realized you don't need to be an expert, uh, just come as you are. You have more than enough uh, to, get into, to get your skin in the game. Thank you. Anyone else? 
No, okay. I think we'll move on to another question then. Uh, this one, uh, this one concerns lobby days, and I don't know if we've lost Christopher or not. I don't see him there at the moment, but uh, um, we'll see who who has an opportunity to answer this. Uh, Mike certainly has experience with this, and maybe maybe some of our other panelists do too. So the idea of a lobby day uh, concerns uh, homeschool organizations that maybe have more than a few families and really want to make an impact at their legislature, whether, whether their education system happens at a provincial or state level or whether it's at a national level. The idea of gathering a lot of families to travel to the legislature for a day and to meet with a number of elected representatives is something that's happened in some countries uh, and in and, and some places happens on an annual basis. Um, maybe a little more challenging in the time of COVID, of course, but uh, uh, who would like to comment on lobby days and, and how they operate? Let me just hit that real quick, Peter. I mean, sure. this is a huge, this is a very rich tradition in the United States. Uh, we have many state organizations that have been doing uh, homeschool days at the Capitol for decades. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, it, it fits in with what Vinicius suggested, what I suggested, what we've all said, Russ, everyone has suggested of bringing the people to the policymaker. Um, that needs to happen in, in the constituency, meaning you want to get your policymaker when they're at home, if you can, in the district, where they're from, where you're from, because it's better, it's more familiar. But it's also helpful and important to bring a show of force, if I can use that terminology, to rally large numbers of homeschoolers to show that you can do that and to remind the legislators, even if you're not bringing as many as you would if you were out to oppose or support legislation, um, that you can rally your constituency, that you can get them there in large enough numbers to be visible. And then you can go out, fan out into the different offices. That also allows you to uh, give them something that they like, which is to speak to a crowd. I mean, that's what a lot of legislators like to do. They like to speak to a crowd about something that they care about that's important to them, uh, that, that, that shows that they're with you, um, even if they're not your particular legislator, you know, they can show that they're with you as a, as an organ, as an, as a movement, and then that word gets back to the, to the district. Um, so, you know, homeschooling is, a, is, is one of those things that a lot of legislators in the United States like to have good relationships with, uh, because homeschoolers volunteer. They're very active civically. Uh, and so it's, it's a really good idea to do this if it's legal in your country. If it's not legal, you know, you might not want to have a rally day at the Capitol. Um, you know, so that's just something to think about. Super. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else? Christopher, uh, I think Pestalozzi Trust may have, may have done a little bit of this in the past. Um, yeah, so the, uh, I don't think we um, we certainly aren't organised on the level of the of the states where you where you have your kind of huge um, where you have kind of a once a year thing. But um, uh, so I think it's, it, Mike mentions it's actually important to have to to have two kind of aspects. I think one understand your your laws. Um, that's the first one. Uh, because you know, if you're not allowed to assemble, don't don't assemble um, <laughs> necessarily. Um, and then secondly, secondly, understand your your, your parliamentary culture. So, so each country has a has a slightly different parliamentary culture. Um, in South Africa, we've got a very um, participatory parliamentary culture, um, and and the the, the 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 and that comes that comes from our history of it of it being fairly exclusive um, historically. So, so now um, it, it's a very, it's a very open culture. Um, I think there's a couple of so, so what I could so the, the incident which was which was actually very charming was that um, home educators. So, and I wouldn't necessarily try this in every country, but in South Africa, uh, babies were brought into the portfolio committee meeting. Um, they were and. And the and um, and the committee chairperson was was very warm and charming, and she said, uh, "We have a we have a educator in we have a learner here who is not yet in school, but is moving in that direction." So, uh, but I think, but be aware of your be aware of your culture in another country that may be considered very disruptive. Um, I think Waswa may I don't know what Kenya is like, but but Africa is a much more child friendly, friendly continent than many others, um, and then I think there's some practical things to be aware of. Um, 
be aware of security when you go in you may need to go through certain security procedures to get into your parliament um great to organize trips most probably uh you know uh, see the parliament trip with children and then try to combine that with um with um with meeting with representatives um uh, we certainly have a huge amount of envy for the amount of civic education that goes on in, in America. We have very little civic education in South Africa. So, so you, can, you can also incorporate that depending on your country. It's, it's often weirdly a neglected school subject. So if it's a neglected school subject, great. And then, then in general, your parliament will be really happy to have you there because they won't be used to having school groups or whatever coming through. Um, and they'll be like really excited that someone's taken the trouble. So, um, yeah, so I think those are kind of practical things you just need to consider when you go to a parliament building. Often useful to send a, an advanced party um, where if you're going to bring kids and, and, and a larger group, let some of your more experienced advocates be there and, and know the way around and then bring the group. So because, I mean, I think there's, you know, there's probably nothing worse than trying to have to corral litty kids through corridors, uh, particularly in, and if it's an old Victorian style building or something. So um, so I think that, that that's another practical thing that you can wear, but absolutely a, a great thing to do. Peter, I have a couple of comments on this as well, if I could. Super. So um, in our province here in, in Canada, um, we had some issues that came up last year under this current COVID situation that we were in. And what, while well, everybody couldn't get to Vancouver Island, which is a bit of a, a hurdle because of you having to take the ferry, it's so far from the rest of the population. They hosted similar meetings like that you were described online on, on a Zoom or this kind of a session. And it was very effective. And one thing we haven't talked about so much today is if your country has an opposition, party or, or an opposition group, uh, contrary to the, to the ruling party or the government, it's also important to educate those in that uh, position, because at some point they may form the government and you want them to be in a position to advocate for you in the next election, because they can reach out to your constituency. And if you show, as Mike used the words, a show of force, whether it's online or in person, they will recognize that you're a group that needs to be considered. And uh, they're in a great opportunity because they're looking for ideas to put in their next platform uh, and how to improve things or win people over. So don't underestimate the power of building that long-term relationship with those that are not yet in government, but that may end up there. Excellent, thank you, Russ. Anybody else have a comment on this question? No, okay. Uh, I think at this uh, uh, point, so sorry, I'll, go. No, I'll just say one more thing, and 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 Russ, maybe think of it as well. Is just uh, just remember that you may have a bicameral system where you have a where you have two houses, an upper house and a lower house, maybe a senate, maybe you've got a provincial house and a and a, a national assembly. Uh, make sure you cover both of those. Don't just focus on one on one chamber or or, or one section of the house. And, and remember that other countries then have, you'll have a provincial structure, a state structure. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of, uh, the, you know, very aware of that in the States, but in your country, you, maybe your provincial parliament doesn't get as much priority as your national parliament. Don't neglect your provincial parliaments, your more regional structures as well. Uh, and, and there could even be um, houses for indigenous representation, um, spe special interest, houses of special interest, um, and, and all of those are worth interacting with. Thank you, Christopher, that's great. Okay, I think at this point, um, I'll, I'll ask each of our panelists if they wouldn't uh, mind uh, sharing some last thoughts and uh, any, any points that they maybe haven't covered and also a word of encouragement for those who are watching from a country somewhere else in the world uh thinking about how do i tackle <laughs> this challenge and uh and and what would you have to say to those folks uh i'm going to start uh i think with russ if i could please and we'll work through the sure peter um at the beginning of my remarks i just briefly commented about ex an experience that i had uh before i even had children of my own where some homeschooling families came to my constituency office much like we've just discussed and it had a lasting impact on me because as a uh, public representative, I would regularly go to 
public schools, sometimes private schools, and meet with classes as they were learning civics in grade five or grade 10, I think it is. But when this particular group, and it wasn't a small group, there might've been 15 people or so, came to my constituency office and they were so um, orderly, they were so polite, they were so clearly knowledgeable, uh, head and shoulder above what I had seen in other institutions uh, with the level of their, of, of their detail of their questions and their insight that they were seeking, it really made a difference. So don't underestimate the power of even a small number of families gathering and making that impact on your elected representatives or your, you know, even if they're not elected, uh, the people that govern your uh, education system. Because it's stories like that that certainly stick with people that I can remember that have a, a lasting impact and can change hearts in the long term. Thank you, Russ. Um, Wazwa. And you're muted. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about an incident where uh, just, just like any homeschooled family, at some point you, you get to discover that no sooner have you bought the books than the books have been read and, 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 and they're done with. And so you are forced to join the local library. And so when you went to sign up at the library, uh, because it is designed for the schooled children, you know, the, 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 the card had one sign where the teacher needed to sign and the other side, it's the parent who needed to sign. Uh, and the librarians had never seen homeschooled children signing up at the library. And so they said, this is beyond our pay grade. You have to go to the chief librarian. And we said, okay, we're happy to do that. Uh, can you show us to her office? And um, went to the office and she asked, what is this homeschooling all about? And I was there with the children and I said, okay, here are the homeschooled ones, ask them. And they told her the things we had been doing uh, and uh, the places we had visited and the memories they had and the books they'd read. And at the end of it all, um, she was so impressed, she asked, is it possible for me to bring my kids for you to homeschool them? Uh, long and short of it is we got uh, library cards uh, issued on that day, started borrowing books immediately. And she asked if we could be part of her helping the community to have a reading culture. Now, to me, that is what advocacy does. Here is a government official. She's a chief librarian. In a very organic way, homeschooling has been demystified for her. And so if this can end up becoming a contagion, then it means the very little things we are doing, even before we get you know, upstream to the legislator and the policymakers, just the people around us, this is where we can start becoming the face and the idea of homeschooling to people who have no idea of what goes in homeschooling. So we can demystify it. I have seen it and it can work for all of us all over the world. Thank you. Vinicius, could I turn to you next? Thank you, Peter. Uh, I would like to, to encourage all the, all the our audience. Uh, here in Brazil, we have faced more than 27 years waiting for the legal recognizement, but just uh, 12 years with organization defending and promoting and advocating homeschooling in Brazil. And so after these 12 years, so organize it, I see that we are increasing too much in, in this way, in this target we have here. Uh, nowadays, we didn't have yet uh, a national law because we have uh, good conditions to, to, to take this point, but we are until now working on it. But we have read three states in Brazil that was recognized and there was signed and approved for the, the local legislative and from the governors, they, they signed it and they approve it. Uh, laws recognizing Rome schooling here. Uh, also different 
uh, cities, they did it. We had, in this time, we also got a, a, a Supreme Court decision uh, recognizing that homeschooling has constitutional support, but need a national law. Because of it, we are working for to get a, a national law. But see, the, the way is too dangerous because we have, of course, uh, oppositions, different kind of lobbies, uh, include the, the teachers union. But when we are talking to, to the congressmen and try to convince the, the audience, the public, uh, the media, uh, is a message from the families. We don't, we will not wait for the law to start homeschool. The homeschool doesn't depend, really doesn't depend from, from the law because it's a natural right, it's a human right. So our law needs to recognize the human right we are talking about. Uh, our institutional need to recognize it. So we used to say that homeschooling in Brazil is unstoppable. And we are increasing and increasing more. We will not stop uh, even if we don't have a law. And about the law, about the law, we used to say we prefer to be without law than we have a bad law. It's prefer it's better to 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 stay in uh, in the way we are. We know that it is not good, it's not comfortable, but it's bad better than have a bad law putting uh, families in so strong control from the state. So. Uh, Raise your head, guys, and up for our audience, of course. Raise your heads and keeps goes on uh, to take this target and to guarantee the freedom for for the families because God is on uh, is on this cause and He is with us. So continue believing Him, continue uh, supporting families, involving families, creating um, groups, organization and believe that we are fighting for freedom and freedom is the best way we can we can keep going going on and to, to the end um, may god continue bless you guys and thank you too much for the the rich panel the rich web, webinar we have today and the the rich advices i received here from you guys thank you thank you vinicius uh, Christopher, do you have some concluding thoughts for us today? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and um, and thank you to all the panelists. Because always, a, 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 as uh, as Venetia said, a rich panel, and you always learn something when you when you take part in one of these panels. Um, I think the uh, I think so, uh, sort of three most probably three three points most probably, um, and it relates back to something that Waswa was saying. I, I don't think you need to be an expert in this. It's it's great if you have some some experts and some skilled people, people with, with Russ's experience coming in and, and supporting you. But but the, 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 but in the absence of that, I think the point is start early. Um, start as early as possible. Don't delay it until tomorrow. Start the process. Um, and then you will and then you will become the expert as as as, as Waswa was pointing out. Um, and COVID is a great time to do it. A lot of parliaments are online. So you you don't you can actually participate uh, by studying it. You know you can he hear what's going on in the parliament, how it works, um, just by following it online. So I think use that opportunity. It, it's a window that will most probably close, but but use that opportunity. Uh, right once again, and it goes back to the start early message. So start early, and this is a great time to start. And then I think make it part of your home education. Uh, make civics and make political engagement part of your home education, make advocacy part of your home education, if that's something that your children are interested in, because in that way, you're also building the next generation of leaders to, to take this fight up. Um, and we know that it's a long-term fight. So in Brazil, they've been doing it for 27 years. We've been doing it a similar kind of time here in South Africa. And, and in fact, one of the issues that we have is this issue of, of handing over the baton now to, to another generation. So I think if you make it part and integrate it into your education, um, 
then you, you, you're also raising up very experienced advocates for the future. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, and uh, as always, a pleasure. Thank you, Christopher. And Mike, you get the last word today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you to my fellow panelists. I'll be very brief. Um, I want to thank everyone who's attended. And if you're listening, there are other sessions available uh, at our YouTube channel at the ghex.world YouTube channel. You can see all of the sessions from the other webinars that we've had about starting your own homeschool advocacy organization. Um, my final word is this. You're not alone. You're not alone. There are many people like you who care about home education, who want to advocate for home education around the world, and you don't have to do it alone. In fact, you shouldn't do it alone. This is too big of a mission. It's too big of a movement for any one person or any one organization to be able to do everything that needs to be done. Um, but you are one person. You are one person in your one country, and so you have to do something. So what my advice is this, take an idea, one idea that you heard today that kind of grabbed you and you know what it is because you've been thinking about it since you heard it. So take that one idea and build a team, find one other person and then work with that person to find another person and other people who, who agree with the vision uh, that you have of that one idea that you think would make a difference uh, in your local community or in your state or in your country and then do something about that one thing. Uh, you know, the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. So take that step, take that step today, write it down, send an email, make a phone call, mention it to someone, and then start the process uh, by meeting together and doing the thing that you have a vision to do. Uh, there's nothing better, in my opinion, than advocating for the right of, of home education. Uh, one of my favorite presidents of the United States was Ronald Reagan. He said, freedom uh, is not something that we pass to our children in their bloodstream. It's something that has to be fought for and won and handed over to every generation so that they can preserve it. And so that's, that's the trust that we have here. That's the call that you're hearing and I wanna thank each person here uh, for the work that they're doing. Uh, and, and I wanna thank you who's listening for the work that you're going to do uh, to, to defend this fundamental, natural, God-given, inalienable right of parents educating their children uh, in accordance with their conscience. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to each of our panelists today. Uh, if you're watching this series and uh, you're watching this episode of this series and you want to watch other episodes, you can find them on ghex.world. And if you have questions that haven't been answered here, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us through the website. Thank you very much.